Physical Science 102. We're getting into chapter 23 today, surface processes. You've probably already figured that nothing in nature happens in a vacuum, so to speak. Uh, surface processes are a way that we back up and look at the big picture from 30,000 feet and see what's happening on the surface of the earth. Now that we have reasonably good understanding of what subsurface processes are, are acting, um, they can help inform what we see on the surface. So we're going to share the PowerPoints. There we go. I'm going to make a slideshow out of this. Let's see. There we go. OK. <clears throat> now, um, when you just back up and look at the uh, surface of the earth, the geology of the earth, over the lifetime of a single person, it doesn't seem to change that much. And um, that's an accurate um, conclusion from what we see. But in geologic time, the Earth's surface is very active. And all we have to do is look at other heavenly bodies that we've visited, and we'll see that um, the difference between very active and non-active, um, our nearest neighbor, the moon, is non-active. And as a result, we see the accumulation of things that have happened to it over several billion years, uh, impact craters. We see the evidence of lava flows. And I have to define that term, of course. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, no, we already defined lava, last chapter, uh, on the surface of the moon. And since it's geologically inactive, those features remain for long periods of time. Whereas on the Earth, if something happens on the Earth, um, processes that uh, the, the surface processes on Earth will erase many of those features, not all of them, uh, and some of them are only partially erased. So it's it's really a detective story to determine what has happened and why things are the way they are. Okay, another way of saying that is nothing is permanent, uh, not on the earth. Uh, as soon as any materials are exposed on the surface of the earth, and in some cases underneath the surface, um, they can receive some uh, other types of exposure, um, they start to degrade. Uh, we call that weathering. These processes begin to destroy what we see and turn it into something else. These weathering processes um, are primarily due to uh, uh, various types of erosion and gravity. So everything flows downhill. If it's not flowing downhill, there must be something holding it there. So, uh, in general, uh, high places tend to be brought down to the low places, and that usually involves transporting sediments. Uh, smaller particles, uh, large particles can move downhill also, depending on the conditions. So definition of weathering, uh, any environmental agents cause the physical disintegration or chemical decomposition 
of rocks and minerals as we, as we have just described them in the last chapter uh, on the Earth's surface. And when we say the Earth's surface, it's not just the interface between atmosphere and, and rocks or ground or between water and ground. Um, many processes, weathering processes on the surface are slightly subsurface. So we always have to keep that in mind. Uh, just think caves, right? So what's happening underneath the, the surface of the earth that we would normally consider surface uh, to produce those caves? Well, weathering is taking place. So weathering isn't confined just to the, uh, what we can see as we stand on the surface. Um, weathering generally takes place um, at a very slow speed. But that's a relative term. Uh, they're slow and then they're slow. And then there's very, very slow. Uh, but the forces at work are irresistible. They will eventually break down everything. It may take a lot of time. And the speed at which weathering occurs uh, depends both on the uh, weathering agent and the material being weathered. So like I said, it depends on the rocks or the mineral types. It depends on uh, moisture availability. Right? If there's plenty of water, then that may be a major environmental agent that causes the weathering. If there's no water, then you have to look at other things like a wind, for, for instance. Uh, temperature has a has a profound influence on weathering. So let's start with mechanical weathering or physical weathering. That's the easiest to wrap your brain around. We're basically breaking down rocks and minerals into smaller pieces, uh, otherwise known as disintegration. But the chemical composition is not changed. You're just making it smaller particle size. Um, one way to do that uh, is in areas where you have seasonal, extreme seasonal changes, uh, where you have water for part of the year, like spring and summer and part of the autumn and then winter comes along and you get uh, freezing. There's an interesting characteristic about water. <clears throat> And you should have picked this up in, in the chemistry chapters. When water freezes, it goes from liquid to solid. And the key difference here is still water, but the density of the liquid is, oh, I don't know, maybe around 0 0.9979 grams per cubic centimeter density. The density of solid water is less. It may be 0 0.9035. Oh, I'm just making those numbers up, but I'm in the ballpark. Grams per cubic centimeter. So what does that mean? Well, if the mass is held constant, then the only thing that can change density is the volume. So if the volume decreases, that means the volume on this side has to be bigger than the volume on that side. Right? So the short story is when water freezes, it expands uh, by about 9%, between 9 and 10%. Uh, volume increase. So that means uh, solid water is less dense than liquid water. That's why ice floats. And ice generally floats with about 10% of its volume above water and the other 90% below water. Look at any iceberg and what you see above water is only about 10% of that uh, berg 
That's why you have to give them a lot of room when you're in a ship. Go way around them because there's a lot more ice underneath that you can't see. So what happens when water gets down into the rock cracks, right? Um, it expands and it pushes the rock apart, fractures it. And then when it thaws, it melts and flows away. And then next season, you get more water in there and it makes the crack bigger. Eventually it breaks off big pieces, little pieces. Um, this frost wedging is a significant weathering process in northern and extreme southern climates. Okay. Now, while we're on the topic of freezing water, um, what we see in uh, soils of northern climates is a what we call a permafrost. In other words, during the winter, the, the water that's in the soil freezes. So the, the, if you're walking across that surface, it feels very solid because it's frozen, it's hard ice, uh, ice mixed with soil. But during the summers, which are usually very short and um, only warm enough to melt down to a, a relatively shallow depth, everything below that is still frozen solid. That's a permafrost. And it's very difficult to navigate uh, these soils because they're saturated with water. So if you drive a vehicle across them, you leave a rut and that rut stays for centuries. Um, but this uh, freeze thaw, thaw cycle uh, in the permafrost also contributes to weathering <clears throat> by similar mechanisms to the uh, previous slide, what we talked about, uh, frost wedging. Um, now, we, we can't discount the, act, the uh, actions and activities of living systems. Burrowing animals uh, go down and, and break things apart, push things apart. Uh, plant roots are remarkably able to break rock. Uh, a root, if it finds a crack in a rock, it will send a root in there and it will split that rock apart. Um, it'll also find a sewer pipe. I had one do that to me on my property. Uh, a root got, got into a weakness in a sewer pipe and went in there and clogged the pipe, but it also ruptured it. So it had to be repaired. Okay, physical weathering. Um, physical weathering, we just mentioned a few things, but uh, water flowing across the surface can't, will help break things apart. Um, uh, wind blowing, uh, pick up particles, sand particles, for instance, and blow them against the surface of a rock will, will erode portions of that rock. That's a physical weathering. You can also get chemical weathering. In this case, you do actually change the chemical structure of the rock or the min mineral usually through the action of water. So in this case, water and temperature are the most important factors for chemical weathering. Um, and temperature is an important factor simply because reactions occur faster as the temperature increases. And water is often named the universal solvent. Right. It's not universal, but it does dissolve a lot of things. 
So this chemical weathering is more efficient when the temperatures are hot and there's lots of moisture and that's tropical climates. So the weathering rate in tropical climates is much, much faster than it is in temperate and uh, frigid climates. For instance, limestone. It's, a, it's common over the Earth's surface. And if it's exposed to rainwater, it will weather very fast. Um, you just walk around um, uh, the major cities in Italy, where uh, during the Renaissance, there were many marble sculptures created, and they're exposed to the elements. Uh, some of them uh, were I understand very beautiful when they were first made. Polished marble with the likenesses of this person or that person uh, or some mythical creature. And walk around there now and uh, you may see the face of a person and the nose is missing. It's weathered away. So how does this weathering occur? Limestone is particularly susceptible to weathering once exposed to the, uh, the air and water, right? It occurs by this process. We have to understand that uh, limestone is composed of calcium carbonate, right? Solid calcium carbonate is limestone. When Rainwater falls through the air. Uh, it picks up carbon dioxide that is part of the atmosphere. And when it does, the um, carbon dioxide reacts with water in the rainfall and produces carbonic acid. Now it's a very weak acid, but it still is acidic enough to react with the calcium carbonate. So when it comes into, when the, um, the carbonic acid comes into contact with any limestone, whether it's exposed as a sculpture or it's part of the, uh, subsurface rock layers uh, underneath the soil or in the soil for that matter, uh, it will uh, react with the calcium carbonate. And I think we've got a slide coming up with uh, that particular reaction. Uh, before I leave this slide, carbon dioxide can be picked up from the atmosphere or when the water percolates through soil, the soil is rich in bacterial activity. Bacteria like to take organic matter and break it down. And when they do, they break it down into carbon dioxide and water. So you've got carbon dioxide available through bacterial action, even at higher concentrations than you do in the atmosphere. So you get this uh, acidified water that's percolating through the soil and through the rock layers underneath. And if they're composed of calcium carbonate, then you get a weathering action. So here's what happens when they come into contact with one another. So you get this one combined with carbonic acid. And <clears throat> one of these hydrogens uh, is kicked off, uh, let's see, yes. And you get a combination where what's left over is that, and that combines with calcium, which is a two plus charge. Remember your chemistry chapters. So it takes two of these. And then what's left over?
No, nothing's left over, right? All you have to do is check for balance, right? One calcium, one calcium, right? Two carbons, a carbon and a carbon. Six oxygens, three and three is six oxygens. Two hydrogens, two hydrogens. So you get calcium bicarbonate or calcium hydrogen carbonate. And this compound is very soluble in water. So once that reaction occurs at the surface of the limestone, then water picks it up. It's dissolved in the water and carried away. That's chemical weathering, one type of chemical weathering. And it tends to accelerate wherever there's sufficient surface area. So if you get a crack in the limestone, the weathering tends to occur there in accelerated fashion because there's more surface area and the crack gets bigger. And eventually the crack can get so big, you form a cave. Okay. So um, in very cold areas, due to the temperature, low temperature, in very dry areas, due to the lack of water, deserts, chemical weathering occurs much, much uh, reduced rate. Um, now, I mentioned earlier that it also depends on the, the uh, base material of the rocks and minerals as to how fast they will weather. That's true for physical as well as chemical weathering. Um, some, if, if you are prone to walk around old cemeteries to look at headstones and get some historical perspective, you may see some headstones that are much older than others based upon the date on the headstone. And you'll also notice that they're more weathered than other stones in the cemetery. If they're made of marble, the uh, chiseled uh, writing on the stone may be almost completely gone. If they're made of something harder, like granite, then they, the weathering will be only slight. Okay, uh, this figure comes straight out of your textbook. It just gives you a good um, summation of the topics we've talked about so far. Uh, these top boxes refer to physical weathering and the bottom ones refer to chemical weathering. Now let me be sure we've covered all our topics. Frost wezzing, crystal growth, we didn't mention that. You can get, um, as water evaporates, you can get uh, deposition of crystals. As the water evaporates, it becomes more concentrated, and then the um, solids come out of solution. They're not changed in any way, so it's still physical weathering, but they lodge themselves in the cracks. And then when they get wet, they expand again. Uh, mechanical exfoliation. All you have to do is just have one rock beat against another one. <laughs> Um, and some of that can occur with the help of water, right? Water can move rocks across, rock across rock, and it would break apart. Um, several years back, actually several decades back, um, there was a kit that was um, marketed, and it was particularly popular among kids. All you would have to do is take rocks and put them in this uh, device and seal them up in there with some water and some other things that they give you in your kit. And uh, it had an electric motor and it would rotate that drum with your rocks in there. And you just let it go for days or weeks, however long it took. Then when you opened it up, very often you had you had rocks that were smooth 
they have been weathered, they've been worn down. Uh, we mentioned root penetration, okay? That fractures rock. Thermal expansion and contraction, we didn't make a big deal out of this one, but rock on the surface, uh, if you heat something up, it's going to expand. So rock at the surface, um, especially in very warm climates, will be heated by the sun and it will expand. But um, rock is not known <laughs> at, at normal uh, surface temperatures to be pliable. Right? So it may expand, but when it does, it cracks. It cracks this way and it cracks underneath also, depending on where its weaknesses are. And that will cause eventual um, exfoliation of pieces of rock and then fresh rock exposed underneath happens all over again. Uh, abrasion, a sort of an inferred abrasion when I was talking about uh, mechanical exfoliation. They're sort of kissing cousins. Chemical dissolution, right? Where you take uh, minerals in the rock, go into solution and are carried away by chemical action, right? They can be oxidized. Um, iron rich minerals, if they're exposed to water and oxygen in the air, will turn into oxides of iron or even oxides of aluminum or, or other oxides. Um, and uh, the interesting thing about iron oxide, I don't need to draw a picture for this one. Um, Everybody knows what a nail looks like or what iron generally looks like or steel. If it rusts, um, the rust comes out, it looks kind of reddish, right? When it combines with oxygen. The interesting thing about rust is it occupies more volume than the iron from which it was made. It expands, right? And when it expands, if that occurs in a crack in a rock, it will help force that rock apart. That's oxidation. Uh, hydrolysis. Uh, what happens here is through the action of water and hydrogen ions, which means acid, um, they can move into a mineral a rock, uh, wherever there's a weakness in the rock, and the hydrogen ions can displace uh, other ions in the mineral. But they can actually go in and kick it out, and it's carried away in solution. Okay, there's your summation. Now, let's go back to erosion. Erosion is a physical process. And it involves uh, the effect of gravity for certain and other types of agents, which could be water, could be wind, uh, could be other soils, could be other particles um, under the influence of gravity helps erode. And it's typically the downslope movement of uh, either the formation of soil or rock on an elevated position that moves downslope. Okay. Um, the movement can be purely gravity influenced, right? And we're gonna define this term later, mass wasting. Uh, it can be under the influence of water and streams. It can actually be under the influence of solid water or ice and glaciers. Winds can be eroding agents. And even waves um, on the surface, I mean, on the um, interface between continents and oceans or surrounding um, elevated areas 
and large lakes, like the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes are so big, they have their own weather. <clears throat> and they produce like, huge waves that impact the coastline and will erode uh, any rocks there and minerals. So if water is the eroding agent, what do we mean? What is going to happen um, when uh, rainfall exceeds the amount of water that can be absorbed by the ground over a particular period of time? In other words, if the rain is very fine and slow, not a lot of rain per hour, then the soil uh, and the surface may be able to absorb it all. And it goes into the, the uh, subsurface layers. But if it occurs really fast, or if the soil is already saturated, then that water will travel on the surface. There's nowhere for, for it to go. That's called runoff, excess water. As the water moves, and it always moves downhill, it can erode, uh, particularly if the surface is loose, such as in a plowed field or over a, a, a denuded forest area. Uh, say you've had clear cutting forestry or you've had a forest fire that has cleared off and killed all the plant life, then uh, running water can erode the surface. Um, the runoff usually occurs over short distances um, before it, it either um, soaks into the ground or it empty, empties into a uh, a larger collection of water moving downhill, a stream. So when we say runoff, that's like a, a sheet of water moving across the surface. Um, when it empties into a channelized collection of runoff, that's a stream. And for a geologist, a stream is a stream is a stream. The Mississippi River is a stream to a geologist. <laughs> so <laughs> we don't have to make a distinction between a stream and a river uh, or a, a brook or any of those other terms. Geologists say stream and that's the end of it. It's a channeled flow of water occurring between two well-defined banks. Now those banks may not be permanent. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later, but the banks that hold the, the stream in place can be moved by the water. Okay. Um, as the stream moves, uh, it has a certain amount of energy, right? And if the stream, has, is there's a very shallow gradient to the movement of the stream, it has low energy. If there's a steep gradient to the stream um, in which you may get rapids forming, uh, that's high energy water because it's moving from a high level to a low level over a very short distance. <clears throat> and the higher the energy of the water as it moves through the stream, the more load it can carry, the sediment load. We call it the stream load. Any materials that are carried by the stream when it's moving is a stream load. Um, the load of the stream can be classified as either, uh, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself, excuse me. Um, these materials can either be solids picked up by the water or they can be dissolved. Right? You can have that um, uh, calcium bicarbonate in solution moving with the stream. 
So the amount of load, I mentioned this earlier, the amount of load depends on the stream gradient, like how fast is it moving, how much of it is there, right? Is it a big stream or is it a small stream? Small streams has less load. How fast is it moving? Right? And that's um, actually a direct result from the stream gradient. So what's the current velocity? We can actually um, estimate the current velocity of a flood and how high the flood was based on how big the materials were moved during that flood event. And what's the channel made of, right? The, the area, the region between the banks is the channel. So what's the channel made of, right? Is it made of soil? Is it made of very hard material? Those are all variables that have to be considered when we're trying to estimate the load. Now, we divide that load into three categories. Right? The dissolved load, I mentioned that earlier, such as calcium bicarbonate, dissolved in the water, but other minerals and other elements are dissolved in the water as well. That was just one example. Then there's the suspended load. That is materials that are carried in the water simply because it has high energy. Right? And they're bouncing around in the water. And the faster it moves, the bigger the particles and the more load it can carry. And then the one that's often overlooked is the bed load. If the particles are so big, that the stream can't carry them in its volume, what it may be able to do is to push them along the bed, just tumble them along the bed. So those are the three, dissolved load, suspended load, and bed load. All make up the total load that is carried by a stream under a given set of circumstances. Uh, we mentioned this, so I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the dissolved load. Uh, but up to 20% of the stream load may be dissolved. So a substantial part could be dissolved in the water. Um, suspended load is typically fine particles uh, to medium size. So maybe um, sand size and smaller suspended in the in the uh, water column. And the bed load are the, are the larger ones that cannot be held up by the energy in the uh, volume of water. Okay, um, some more terms. The um, stream, um, channel is roughly V-shaped, especially when it's young, when it's first getting started, when the um, uh, lost my terminology. Runoff, excuse me. When, when the runoff first is collected into a stream, the channel is pretty close to a V shape. It's only when it uh, matures and the gradient starts to decrease and how long the channel has been active, uh, it tends to be more U shaped. But in the beginning, they're fairly V shaped uh, channels. Okay, um, that's why they say the upstream portion is V-shaped. Um, once the stream gradient starts to level out and um, it reaches the level of any standing body of water, 
So the stream flows into a standing body of water, like a pond, a lake, or an ocean. Uh, it cannot erode any further. It's not moving fast enough, and it's not. It does. It's not in contact with um, the edges or the bottom of the stream. So once it reaches that base level, that's what we call it. The base level, the ocean then whatever it's carrying, physically carrying, will drop out. This base level is the, um, the level at which the stream cannot erode any further. All right. So here's our V-shaped valley. This is a pretty, actually a pretty big stream. <laughs> the reason it's still V-shaped is because it's flowing through rock. It's very resistant material. So it tends to be more V-shaped. And it's, it's moving for pretty fast too. Notice we've got some rapids building up in here. So we talked about the upstream. How about the downstream portion of the, of the stream? When the, uh, when the flowing water approaches the stream's ultimate base level, at the lake, at the ocean, whatever the case may be, um, in that region, the erosion starts to slow. And then as it enters the, uh, base level of the lake or the ocean. Um, there's no more energy that can be expended. It's used up all of its energy. Um, Now we're getting into, all right, <clears throat> if the stream um, slows down, but it does not enter uh, the um, base level, it hasn't reached its base level yet, but it's slowed down and it's um, moving a lot slower, then it's unable to erode significantly vertically. It doesn't erode vertically anymore. Whereas when it's got a lot of energy, it's trying to cut down into the underlying material. <clears throat> but when it slows down, but it hadn't reached the lake yet, then the only option it has now is to erode the sides of the bank. And it may expand for that matter, and, and now it's not V-shaped anymore, it's more U-shaped. And there may be also some various flooding events. So if the inflow of water is higher than the existing banks can handle, it will overflow its banks and continue to erode, um, at least until it slows down even further. And it spreads out into a wide area a floodplain, so to speak. Okay. What happens is, as the uh, water exceeds its banks and moves out into the floodplain, let's take the, the stream and section it. So the stream is moving this way. And now we've got a stream here and it's got, and there's water in it. And if the water increases, then it floods, then the water's gonna move out this way and that way, okay? It's gonna carry uh, its load with it. And what it's gonna do is as it 
as it moves out in a sheet over a wide area, it slows down. It loses energy. So as it loses energy, its load drops out, right? It, it uh, forms a sediment. So what comes out first? The heavy stuff comes out first. So you're gonna get sand right here. Right? Larger particles. And then um, as it slows down even further, further away, you're going to get the silts and then the clays, all based upon particle size. So if you if you transect, if you take a, a soil probe and go down and poke down here, and as you go away from the river, you'll uh, discover that mostly sand here, then silt, and then clay as you get further away. But, but that's not a bad thing, unless you've got crops growing there, or animals there, or you built uh, a barn there. <laughs> that could be a problem. <clears throat> but people generally um, have settled in these floodplains because they're very fertile. The load that the stream carries has with it in it nutrients that replace nutrients that you've used up if you're growing crops in this area. So if it floods over this area, um, and over time, it builds up very thick sediments. And um, if you treat them correctly, you can farm this for many generations. Uh, and they're very productive. That's why floodplains tend to be heavily populated. But it's a double-edged sword, right? You can, uh, you can gain uh, wealth from these areas, but just like settling around volcanoes that we talked about in the last chapter, those soils tend to be very uh, productive also around volcanoes. But the hazard is the volcano could blow up any time. Uh, in the floodplains, you could get flooded out. So what do we do? We build levees <laughs> and confine the river so that it keeps going and doesn't overtop its banks. And then we carry on out here in these good soils for as long as possible. We'll talk about the, the that's the good thing for flood control, but there's a bad thing too. And we'll talk about that in a subsequent slide. Okay, once these streams get down into these uh, lower areas and they're, they're not moving really fast, they're still moving, you know, down the gradient, but the erosion that they impose on their surroundings occurs at the sides, on the banks, primarily. What they tend to do is start producing bends. We call them meanders. <clears throat> so um, all you need to create a meander is a um, disturbance and time. And remember, water always moves downhill and it always takes the path of least resistance. So with that in mind, what happens is as, if you get a disturbance here, say a, a rock settles, then the water tends to move around it. Well, what it's gonna do is speed up and it's going to erode that bank, right? And then it's gonna shoot, as it comes off that side, it's gonna shoot and bang into this bank and erode that. So it tends to, to form S curves. Well, once you get these S curves started, the water moves fastest on the outer side of the curve. 
and slowest on the inside. So inside curve is going to move slow and drop its sediment, right? And that starts building the inside of the curve. And once you get a meander started, they're self-perpetuating. So you get a combination of erosion and deposition. Deposition in the inside and erosion on the outside. And they just keep going like that. In fact, they can keep making these, the meanders can get so sinuous that sometimes the meander will come around like this and it'll meet. Right? As the crow flies, you could take a few steps and get from this side of the river to that side. But the river goes around and it may meet. And if it uh, overtops where it meets, then it may isolate that bend and take the path of least resistance. And when that happens, you get an oxbow lake. I'm going to show you some examples here in a minute. First, we're going to have a little video that's going to talk about uh, how meanders form. Compared to the white water streams that tumble down mountainsides, the meandering rivers of the plains may seem tame and lazy, but mountain streams are corralled by the steep walled valleys they carve. Their courses are literally set in stone. Out on the open plains, those stony walls give way to soft soil allowing rivers to shift their banks and set their own ever-changing courses to the sea. Courses that almost never run straight, at least not for long, because all it takes to turn a straight stretch of river into a bendy one is a little disturbance and a lot of time. And in nature, there's plenty of both. Say, for example, that a muskrat burrows herself a den in one bank of a stream. Her tunnels make for a cozy home, but they also weaken the bank, which eventually begins to crumble and slump into the stream. Water rushes into the newly formed hollow, sweeping away loose dirt and making the hollow even hollower, which lets the water rush a little faster and sweep away a little more dirt, and so on and so on. As more of the stream's flow is diverted into the deepening hole on one bank and away from the other side of the channel, the flow there weakens and slows. And since slow-moving water can't carry the sand-sized particles that fast-moving water can, the dirt drops to the bottom and builds up to make the water there even shallower and slower and then keeps accumulating until it becomes new land on the inside bank. Meanwhile, the fast moving water near the outside bank sweeps out of the curve with enough momentum to carry it across the channel and slam it into the other side, where it starts to carve another curve, and then another, and then another, and then another. The wider the stream, the longer it takes the slingshotting current to reach the other side, and the greater the downstream distance to the next curve. In fact, measurements of meandering streams all over the world reveal a strikingly regular pattern. The length of one S-shaped meander tends to be about six times the width of the channel. So little tiny meandering streams tend to look just like miniature versions of their bigger relatives. As long as nothing gets in the way of a river's meandering, its curves will continue to grow curvier and curvier until they loop around and bumble into themselves. When that happens, the river's channel follows the straighter path downhill leaving behind a crescent-shaped remnant called an oxbow lake. Or a billabong. Or un lago en herradura. Ou un bravo. We have lots of names for these lakes, since they can occur pretty much anywhere liquid flows, or used to. Which brings up an interesting question. What do the Martians call them? This Minute Earth video is brought to you by you if you want to, because we've started a new crowdfunding campaign on the website patreon.com to help remove banner ads and support Minute Earth going forward. And we'd be honored if you considered helping us out by going to <coughs> patreon.com slash Minute Earth. Okay. <clears throat> I always try to leave the credits uh, because these people went to a lot of trouble to produce this thing. And if they want to put something else in there, they have every right to. So I let it run. Okay. So um, that shows the, the formation of a meander in a, in a natural setting. What I'm going to show you now 
is a, an experimental uh, stream bed. It's got sand sized particles in a, in a kind of a box and they just uh, tilt it up a little bit, you know, to make sure the water runs down and they run water down through this channel. The channel is reasonably straight to begin with. Okay. The point of this particular video is that no matter how straight you make that channel, meanders always form. Because there, there are uh, imperfections that we can't see. And all it takes is just one tiny disturbance to get the ball rolling. And from then on, it just perpetuates. So let's take a look at this one and you'll see um, it's not very long. Yeah, less than a minute. So they colored the water green so that you could see it better. And here we got meanders forming already. You also get, you'll see sometimes you get um, islands formed in the middle temporarily. Water moves around them. But the stream is widening as the meanders advance. Pretty dramatic. <laughs> okay. So now <clears throat> I've got this video. Um, I produced it with Google Earth, and I just zoomed in and recorded it, zoomed in to um, the Mississippi River near Baton Rouge. Um, I'm very familiar with this area. I lived in Baton Rouge for 13 years and uh, worked in Louisiana for all that time. And the um, southern Louisiana in particular has um, lots of meanders, particularly in the Mississippi River, but other rivers too. And I'm gonna also show you an oxbow lake. So let's start this video and I'll, I'll pause it as needed. We'll get started in a second. There we go. So we ended up at a place called False River, which is nothing more than an oxbow lake. And you can see the bend. Um, I'll also call your attention to these uh, regular shaped geometric patterns. Those are farmer's fields. These, like we said, those field, those soils are extremely productive. So they've been partitioned. You'll also notice along the edges here, you have road, a road on one side, a road on the other, and you have development. There are people living there, lots of people living there. Okay, let's keep this thing going. Okay, so now, oh, I'm sorry. I messed up. I clicked the wrong button. There we go. So now you can see the Mississippi River here. Uh, there's a couple of islands in the middle of it. You've got meanders and you've got this Oxbow Lake that formed and you can, you can probably see uh, the outline of where it originally flowed on the upper portion and the lower portion. So I'm going to zoom in on that, I think, coming up. I'll show you some meanders first. And in the lower right-hand corner is Baton Rouge, the capital of Louisiana. Here it comes. I'll zoom in a little more.
I'll probably pause the Zoom here to give myself time to talk about it. Okay, there we go. Now, let me pause it here. Uh, I mentioned uh, development. You can see houses and, and roads along here. You'll also see uh, an outflow of water here, or an inflow, whichever the case may be. It's uh, ancient remnant stream bed flowing along here, and these are trees growing all along the edge. Um, you'll also notice that there's a road built here that along that way, and there's a road built here along this way. Right there. It's customary in Louisiana because the, the um, uh, in southern Louisiana, the soils are not very stable because they're usually saturated. Uh, but the elevation above sea level is in the neighborhood of uh, 10 or 20 feet. So what you want to do is if you're going to build a road, you've either got to build it up high enough to keep it dry or build it on a natural levee. This was once the river. So the high point is right along the edge of where the stream bank used to be. That's why they put the roads there because they're high ground. Okay. And I think coming up, you see the stream and uh, moving here. There's a, a lake here that was never completely filled in. Now we're out to the river. Okay. So at one point, the Mississippi River followed that. Let's see, this is the this is the lower side. So this would be where it would have exited. <clears throat> okay. Let's let this one finish, run its course. I'm gonna show a bunch of more meanders in the Mississippi. Uh, another characteristic, another clue uh, that meanders give us is you don't find meanders, substantial meanders in young streams large meanders with lots of oxbow lakes are part of very old river systems. And that's the Mississippi River. It's been around for a long time, thousands and thousands of years. Okay, let's let it finish and then we'll move to the next slide. Okay, so when the stream reaches its base level. When the stream reaches its base level at a lake or a, um, an ocean, it, uh, now it's at the same potential energy as the lake or the ocean. And it moves out, slows down, and now it drops its load. And when it does that, um, at, at the mouth of its entrance, right, it drops that load, it starts to build up, right? And the water can't go through it, it has to go around it. So you get usually form a delta, which is simply deposition of the stream load at the um, base level. Um, now, the Mississippi River is a, a massive example <laughs> of, uh, uh, of a, um, a load carried to, its, uh, to the ocean and forming a delta. And it carries around 500 million tons of sediment into the Gulf of Mexico every year. That is a lot. That's a huge load. 
And most of this accumulates at the mouth of the river, forming this delta, right? Why do we call it a delta? Because some of these structures actually look like the Greek letter delta. That's why I put it down there. Looks like that triangle. But there's variability, but it's as good a name as any. All right, how is a delta formed? I've got a, a video here to help you with that. Since the beginning of human civilization, people have settled along rivers and on the fertile deltas created by them. The sediment carried and deposited by mighty rushing waters creates land rich in nutrients and ideal for crops and livestock. Where there are uninhibited rivers, there is new, rich land, and where such resources abound, there are people. The problem with people settling along rivers and deltas is that rivers inevitably flood. This is good for the land because sediment from the water is deposited on the previously dry earth and replenishes the soil. However, the flooding can destroy the human homes established there. Thus, we build levees around these river titans in an attempt to keep the lumbering giants at bay. Louisiana has two of these breathing rivers, the Mississippi and its distributary, the Atchafalaya. The Mississippi has made Louisiana an international port of trade and commerce, and both rivers have contributed to the lush habitat of Louisiana's people and animals. Many smaller rivers feed into the Mississippi, creating a vast watershed that drains nearly 40% of the continental United States, and all combine to bring the Mississippi and its delta to life. The long-term consequence of levees, however, is prevention of land formation. Rivers deposit sediment in one area over hundreds or thousands of years until the accumulation is so great that the new topography of the land causes the river to change course and begin to deposit sediment somewhere new. When a river is prevented by levees from flooding or changing course, the sediment it carries cannot build up the land, and over time erosion begins to wear away the already existing earth. In the case of the Mississippi River, these levees also mean that all of the sediment carried by the river is dumped uselessly into the Gulf of Mexico and over the continental shelf, illustrated here. As a result, the land of Louisiana's coast is sinking and eroding at an alarming rate, and people's homes and livelihoods are again in jeopardy. Here is a simplistic depiction of how a delta unrestricted by levees is formed. This model represents a bird's foot delta, similar to the Mississippi. Here we see the sediment being churned up and carried by the rushing waters. As more and more sediment rides with the water, the sand, silt, and clay begins to build up along the banks and in certain parts of the river mouth until channels are formed. Finally, the sediment has piled up so much that the water has had to divert itself around the newly created islands, and we now have an emerging bird foot delta. Now, vegetation begins to form on the newly created and nutrient enriched land around the river and on top of the islands. Before and after, natural land production is a slow process. This delta would have taken approximately 1,000 years to form. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to pause and back up because I want to make a point out of something. Let's go back here. This part of the video uh, has uh, numbered geologically historical delta formations. So they're, they're in order. Number one, this is where the Mississippi River used to enter the Gulf through this region right here. That built up so high that it shifted and it shifted and came out here. And then it shifted and came out here, shifted again, went back over here, then here. And now it's dumping sediment here in this region. The reason that it's so far out away, notice that all these uh, form an arc right? Naturally occurring, they tend to be that far. 
This number six is way out into the Gulf because of the levee system. The river is now confined by these levees, dikes, if you will, on the sides. And it cannot over, overtop its bank and flood. Right? It cannot naturally change its course anymore. So all that sediment that's coming down the river has to go straight out into the Gulf. And it's forming this bird's foot delta further out in the Gulf than ever before. And since it cannot overtop its bank and deposit its sediment load in this region, then natural subsidence is not balanced anymore by the flooding and deposition of new sediment. So all this area in here is subsiding and Louisiana is losing um, surface land area year by year. Okay, so let's move to the next slide. Why don't we? Um, this shows the progression of delta formation in the Atchafalaya Bay. Remember, the Atchafalaya is a distributary of the Mississippi. So if you look at it this way, um, Louisiana is like this, and like this, like that, sort of. And then you get the Mississippi out here like this, okay? So the Mississippi River is coming down here and it's wiggle, 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 and it's coming out here. But right about in here, uh, there's a branch that forms. Well, actually, it, it comes like this. And it goes down over here. This is the Atchafalaya River. Now, the Atchafalaya is also uh, fed by the Red River. The Red River comes from up here. And right here, there's a crossover. The Mississippi River, if given its choice, would divert over into the Atchafalaya and most of this down through here would dry up. But that would devastate New Orleans and other uh, economic activities along the Mississippi. So there are structures built here to keep it from doing that. But the structures are built in such a way that they can let some of the water over and keep the Atchafalaya flowing. Um, I had a video on that, but I've already got so many videos. I didn't want to put that one in there because it would just, it would just take too much time. But they, they do exist. If you want to know more about this, look for the old river structure. Okay, uh, this is the Atchafalaya Delta. So it comes out here. And there are actually two places. The Atchafalaya River is here. And this is, what is that called? I forget the name of that one. This is a man-made channel that helps divert some of the water that can't make it out fast enough and keeps this area from flooding. So you're gonna see two deltas develop, one here and one here. And these are derived from satellite images. Wax Lake outlet. And you can see meanders all over the place here. Right? So now we're going to have sort of a time lapse. Nineteen eighty four. Here we go.
almost seems alive. Okay, so let's move to the next slide. Here we go. Now we talked about um, erosion mechanisms. And up to this point, we focused on water. Now we're going to look at solid water, glaciers, how glaciers uh, work and erode um, minerals and rocks. Glacier is, everybody has an idea of what a glacier is, but this is the, the definition. Large mass of ice that covers part of the Earth year round. In other words, uh, it may change shape over time, but the glacier overall is a permanent fixture over short periods of time anyway. How glaciers form? Glaciers form from primarily from snowfall. Snowfalls does not melt. Snowfalls doesn't melt. It starts adding weight above the snow. And, and it compacts the lower layers, and they actually change their crystal structure from individual snowflakes into solid ice. And when they move, and they do move, they move under the influence of gravity. Gravity causes them to move downhill, and they are massive. I'm talking about tons and tons and tons and tons of material of ice. Um, there was a time when a large portion of North America was covered in glaciers. Um, this occurred, this was, and they, the glaciers, those glaciers were miles thick. But about 10,000 years ago, the earth started to warm up and they receded, they melted and receded. We now have about 1,100 glaciers in the lower 48 states. Now, Alaska has lots of glaciers simply because it's further north. Three percent of the state is covered in glaciers. That's a large, that's a lot of acreage. So here's the formation of glaciers. More snow accumulates than melts. Right? So you get a, a net increase in snow and subsequently ice. And eventually it gets heavy enough that it flows downhill. Um, just a side note, most of the icebergs in the North Atlantic um, are derived from glaciers that are calving uh, parts of themselves into the ocean, where the glacier runs off of the land and meets the ocean, then these icebergs come off of that glacier because it's still moving, right? And if it moves out over the water, um, but they can't support it. And it starts to, the fractures melt and big pieces of it slough off. Now, the different types of glaciers. The glaciers that form the uh, icebergs are continental glaciers. They cover large land masses. And they're typically um, Greenland and Antarctica have the largest continental glaciers on the planet. Now these glaciers um, start on land. Even if they do reach the water, they begin on land. The Cirque Glacier, much smaller than the continental glacier, usually found in mountain regions. And 
they accumulate snow and form this compacted ice in valleys, uh, usually shaded valleys, where the sun doesn't really reach them large parts of the, of the day or the year. And that allows them to accumulate more snow than melts. Most of the glaciers in the United States are cert glaciers. <clears throat> and as the glacier flows, it carves out a U-shaped valley, which is called the cirque. It's a depression, it looks like an amphitheater. If, um, if the um, glacier recedes and starts to uh, melt, then some of that water may collect in these depressions, and we call those cirque lakes. I'm going to show you, and we'll talk about some, some reasons for the cirque lake forming. Right, because you would you would reason that if it's, it's if it's carving a path through the valley and it starts to melt, then the water will just run off and go down the valley like a stream. But that's not the only thing that happens when a glacier moves. Okay. Um, a valley glacier is a type of cert glacier. It occurs when the entire valley is covered in glacial ice and the glacier flows down the valley. The, the flow rates depend on several factors. Um, and we'll talk about those. But the flow rate can range from just a few centimeters a day to meters. I mean, they can move really fast. And once the glacier reaches uh, lower levels where it's warmer and the sun can reach it, like it comes out from behind the mountain, then it starts to melt. And this balance between accumulation in the upper elevation and melting in the lower elevation um, can cause the glacier to look like it's static because it's moving but melting. Right? So the face tends to stay in the same position. It's a balancing act. Now, what do these glaciers do when they move? Well, they're ice, they're solid, but they also pick up uh, rocks, minerals, sediments as they move. And, and it's just like sandpaper. You get these rocks on the bottom of the glacier, and as it moves, they rub against the surface. And that gives the glacier more impact on the, uh, the rock and the perimeters. Now, when the um, um, continental glaciers uh, before 10,000 years ago, when they moved onto the North American continent, they were so huge, so thick and heavy, that they actually depressed the land surface. And as they moved, there was so much pressure behind them that they ground the underlying material into a very fine silt and clay particle size, very small particle size. So that when they receded and the climate became drier and there was no vegetation, then these um, silts and clays were light enough that the winds could pick them up and blow them. And they blew them into vast, deep um, accumulations, beds of primarily silt with some clay. And it, it's called... This material is called LUS. And the Midwestern United States is, is thick with the stuff. 
um, it's really good for growing grasses. So wheat, corn, barley, all those crops, they, they thrive on those soils. <laughs> okay. Even though these glaciers move much slower than streams, they're not as selective <laughs> in, in the erosion that they produce, right? They grind everything and they pick up anything of any size, even huge boulders they'll pick up and carry them with, along with them. And when they recede, they leave the boulders behind. Okay. This boulder was, was delivered by a glacier. And you can see where glaciers have been before, right? In this mountain, you can see U-shaped track. That used to have a glacier in it. Okay. The, um, the deposits that come off of this grinding action, the solid material that comes out of this reaction is called till. Um, it's transported by the glacier and deposited someplace. So the general terminology for it is till. They're generally not well sorted. In other words, they're a conglomeration of different particle sizes. Unlike sediments from a river, right? Uh, like I showed you with the river that overtopped its bank, sand, silt, clay, um, these deposits are a mix of everything. They could be large stones right down to clay particle sizes. And they're generally not layered. Now, when the glacier deposits these things, um, they may form ridges um, along the sides of the glacier where it's, where it's eating into the bank, the sides of the, the, uh, its, its banks. Um, it'll form uh, lateral accumulations called lateral moraines. Or at the very leading edge, it's pushing things ahead of it. These are called terminal moraines. The terminal moraine furthest down in the valley marks the furthest point that the glacier has ever advanced in its whole life. The glacier may be way back up the valley now, and many of them are, but you may find uh, a ridge of material collected further down the valley. That's as far as the glacier moved when it was active. Now these moraines in the, um, in the, the valley glaciers uh, will just cover maybe a, a mile or two across. It may be 100 yards wide, 100 yards deep. But when you're talking about the continental glaciers that covered the North, North America, um, thousands of years ago, they formed moraines that were huge. In other words, they would be hundreds and hundreds of feet tall and miles wide, miles deep, and many, many miles wide. The uh, when the glaciers started to recede, that also is used to mark the difference of a glacial period, of the, the division between two glacial periods. The Pleistocene was a time of glaciation. And then when the glaciers receded, that started the Holocene. So we're in the Holocene period now. Okay, here's a diagram that shows you, uh, let's start at the bottom. Here's the terminal moraine. That's as far as the glacier moved. But the glacier can advance and retreat, advance and retreat several times over its life. 
And in this case, it advanced and retreated from this level, right? It made it as far as this one at one time, but now uh, it made it down to this level another time. And these are called recessional moraines. So it moves down, recedes, and leaves this behind. It moves down, maybe not as far, recedes again. Or it can overtop this one and recede again. <coughs> This is the terminus of the glacier, which is easy to, to identify. Um, moraines can occur along the outer edges where they're grinding away rocks from the sides. And if two glaciers or more meet, then their lateral moraines along the edges can meet. And now they're embedded and moving with the glacier as medial moraines, but right? they're in the middle. All righty. That took care of ice as an erosion mechanism. Now we're gonna look at wind. Wind tends to behave, uh, tends to produce erosion at a slower rate, but it can be significant, particularly in desert areas. Why? Because in deserts, you don't have water, the surface dries out, and the vegetation is more sparsely distributed, which means the surface of uh, the, the soil, the surface of the land, uh, is now um, more likely to be individual particles. They're not held together by plants. So when the wind comes along, if it's blowing fast enough, It'll pick those particles up and carry them great distances. And when it meets an obstacle, it blasts it. It's like sandblasting a, a I don't know, um, a car body. Right? You're trying to get the rust off. You sandblast it. And that sand will erode the surfaces. Now, how do we define a desert? Right. If we're going to talk about deserts, we need to know how they're defined. A desert is defined by the amount of precipitation, not by the temperature. So you can have a, a tropical desert where the temperatures are high. You can have a temperate desert where the temperatures are moderate, right, where we live now. Or you can have an, um, an Arctic desert where the the, their freezing temperatures 11 months out of the year. We define a desert based upon how much precipitation it gets. It gets less than 10 inches of rain or rain equivalent per year. Right? So if it gets um, rule of thumb, snow is usually in the neighborhood of five inches, six inches of snow for every one inch of water that it forms. So if, if there's less than 10 inches of rain per year, we classify it as a desert. But that doesn't mean they don't get a lot of water occasionally. And in fact, that's usually the way they get their water. Occasional thunderstorms move through and then you don't see anything for months. And when that happens, the uh, water, the rain, the runoff from that thunderstorm causes significant erosion because deserts tend to be more sparsely populated with plants, can't hold the soil. So you get very high erosion in deserts from thunderstorms. But when there's no water around, then the wind is your primary acting agent. Um, an example of wind erosion, is the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. Right? Two things caused the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. And seriously, it was a Dust Bowl. In other words, when you saw a dust storm coming your way, you battened down the hatches and tried and just tried to wait it out. <laughs> and then when it's gone, you had to decide, am I going to stay here or am I going to move? A lot of people moved. 
Okay, two things cause the Dust Bowl. One is unusually dry conditions over extended periods of time, a drought for years. And the other was bad agricultural practices. Uh, clear cut any forest, plow it up, uh, uh, monocrops, only one type of crop, and you leave the land fallow over the winter. You don't put any kind of cover crop on it, it just stays bare. That's a recipe for disaster if a drought occurs. Because now the soil is exposed and the wind can pick it up. Okay, other types of movement, right? Under the influence of gravity, you can get what's called mass wasting. That's simply downslope movement of rock and soil. Okay. Um, there's a battle between gravity and friction. If there is sufficient friction uh, under the materials, then gravity will not pull them down the hillside. But if the slope is steep enough and other factors influence the friction, then you can get movement of material. Especially if there's water involved. Water is a very good lubricant and it adds mass. If you get rainfall on a surface, on a, a hillside, then it adds mass and that gives the gravity more purchase on that material. Plus water lubricates it, loosens the particles and they just, they can move. Also known as slope failure. California, this happens all the time. Apparently the, the soils and the steep nature of the terrain in certain parts of California uh, lend it to this type of mass wasting and frequent forest fires or frequent fires of any kind, brush fires, forest fires, uh, kill the vegetation that, that hold the soil in place. So there's nothing to hold it there, it moves. And they get periodic rainstorms. So all the combinations make California prime region for mass wasting. Okay, we can classify mass wasting as either catastrophic or a fast movement that we normally would identify as either landslide or mud flows. Right, landslide is simply the rapid downslope movement of large amounts of material. It can be rock, it can be soil. If it's, if it's largely rock, we call it a rock slide rather than a landslide. Mud flows, if we get lots of rain, right, saturates the soil, <coughs> moves. A special kind of mud flow um, that usually occurs around volcanoes. And it, and it um, is an accumulation of uh, snow melt from the mountainside when the volcano erupts uh, and accumulated uh, subsurface water will weaken it and it'll move down into nearby streams and add with that water. And then you get this uh, mix of water and mud the moving down the stream and that's called a lahar, and they're deadly because there's a lot more mass there than you would expect from water, and they, they can uh, destroy everything in their path. There's a rock slide. See how big that rock is? <laughs> that is one big rock. And here's a, uh, a landslide that occurs in um, some place in California. Right? It just there's nothing you can do. I mean, it just 
it's just the, the structure fails and it covers everything in its path. Now, non-catastrophic uh, mass wasting. A slump is a relatively slow downslope movement of a, uh, a block of overburden. It can be rock, it can be soil, mixture of the two, but it occurs in mass. The whole thing moves at once. That's a slump. And they generally leave this curved depression in the slope behind them where they detached. Even slower than that is a creep. It's very slow, almost imperceptible. Over years, you can see the creep occur. And it's often evidenced by the way the plants respond to it. I've got a, a slide here to show you in a minute. If you've got lots of vegetation, lots of root structure built up in the soil, then it uh, slump and creep are less likely to occur. It's a stabilizing influence when you have vegetation. All right, here's a creep. Notice that this hillside has been creeping, and as it creeps, the trees try to straighten up. So it creeps a little bit, and then this, <laughs> the tree straightens up, and it creeps a little more, and it straightens up some more. So you get bends in the bottom of the trees. OK, since water is such an important factor in these uh, surface processes, we need to look at uh, water a little closer. Um, uh, this is just a blanket statement. Water is definitely essential for life and required for us to maintain. Um, normally, uh, the human body has between 55 and 60 percent by mass of water. So we're basically just big water bags. Uh, civilizations tend to flourish where there's plenty of water, like right? along river valleys and lakes and by oceans. Um, even today, we are dependent upon water. I've heard it said that um, we're in a, a, a time of energy crisis now. Um, and much of that is, is created by our political system. But um, our current fossil fuels will eventually run out. But even more serious than that is the availability of fresh water. I mean, the planet is covered, 70% surface area is covered in water, but that's salt water. Fresh water is only a minor component of that. All right, so we have to be keenly aware of where the water is, where the fresh water is, where it's moving, and how we manage it. Now, how does the water move when man's not involved? That's the hydrologic cycle. Water tends to evaporate from various sources. It can evaporate from large bodies of water, from rivers, streams, from lakes, from the ocean. Water can evaporate into the atmosphere. And when it does, that's a process that is akin to distillation, right? Only the water leaves the surface of the, uh, the body of water. Only water vapor leaves. And then it forms, uh, luckily, forms clouds. And those clouds move over certain areas. And when they become saturated and the conditions are right, we've studied that with our weather, um, that water will fall as rain. That water is essentially distilled water with some dissolved particles in it as precipitation. 
And when it does, it soaks into the ground and or it runs off into streams and the cycle repeats itself. Um, this water that, that it has been precipitated, precipitation of water, uh, will soak into the soils. It'll even soak down into the bedrock because the bedrock is not a, a, a solid unit. It has cracks in it and the water will flow into those cracks and move through the bedrock. So here's a, an, uh, a look at the Earth's um, 1.25 times 10 to the 18th cubic meters of water, which is constantly in motion. Right. There's more than that. there's more water than that on on the Earth, but that's how much is in the cycle itself at any one time. And this just shows the movement of water. Right, you get evaporation, you get precipitation. Um, the precipitation can fall as snow and form glaciers, which move back to down. Um, precipitation can fall on land and make streams. They can evaporate too. One thing I left out was the evaporation that is facilitated by plant life. Right? Huge amounts of water are sent back into the atmosphere by plants as they draw water through their roots, up through their leaves and expel it. That puts water vapor back in the air. Okay. I already mentioned that 70% of the earth is covered with water. 97.2% is ocean water. About uh, a little over 2% is frozen in ice caps and glaciers. Now I'm thinking 70% of the earth's surface is covered in water, but by volume, the oceans are 97% of the water on the earth. And so we, we switched our units of measure here from surface area percentage to volume percentage. All right, so a, a significant amount of the volume of water on the surface of the earth is locked away in ice caps and glaciers. And only in less than a percent is found in lake streams and groundwater and in the atmosphere. So even less of that is available to us uh, in rivers and lakes and groundwater. Groundwater serves as a source of fresh drinking water uh, for a, over half of the Earth's population. And um, the water that's supplied to our crops is drawn from groundwater for irrigation. And irrigation accounts for half of the water that goes out over the land. The other half, of course, is rainfall. OK, so we have to consider this groundwater as a precious resource. Our usage of groundwater is increasing. As the human population increases, we're drawing more water from, from ground reservoirs. And that is basically fresh water with some other dissolved minerals involved. The, the bad part is that we're using water faster than it's recharged. Some water we call fossil water We can divide um, groundwater into two types, rechargeable and fossil. Rechargeable groundwater uh, is able to uh, accept water from the surface to replenish the water that we, the, we remove through wells. Fossil water 
was accumulated there centuries, thousands of years ago, and is locked in place. And there's no way for more water to get in there. So when we pull it out, um, we're depleting that resource, it cannot be recharged. <clears throat> the other problem is pollution. Um, very often we do things, uh, particularly to, well, it can occur either for rechargeable or fossil, <clears throat> but primarily for rechargeable waters. Um, we add things to the environment that accumulate in these uh, subsurface layers where the water is stored. And if enough of that builds up, that water becomes unusable. All right, so where does this water accumulate? I thought rock was solid, right? Now, rock has pores in it, right? And the groundwater accumulates in those pores. So the bigger the pores, the more water you can accumulate in any structure, subsurface structure. And that porosity is a measure of the percentage of the structure that is uh, void. In other words, accepting of something else in it. It could be gases, uh, it could be water, it could be anything. <clears throat> All right. Another key characteristic of the uh, groundwater reservoir is permeability. If, the, if they're more permeable, then you can move water into them quicker and more of it. And you can actually transfer water from one place to another through very permeable rock layers. It can flow. And it also, in addition to how many pores you have, uh, how big are the pores, also, are the pores connected? If the pores are connected, then there's a channel for the water to move from one place to another. Loosely packed sand or gravel in these structures has had large pores. So if you've got um, a layer of sand and gravel down deep, then more than likely it's going to be saturated with water. That's a good place to go to get your water. Muds and clays though have very small microscopic pores. They're not very permeable. Um, so they don't store as much water. But that doesn't mean they're, they aren't useful. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, I used to work for a man in Louisiana who had a piece of property north of Baton Rouge. And he was raising cattle on that property, but he needed a, uh, an impoundment to hold water for his cattle. Well, one thing he had to know was if he built a dam across uh, a stream, would the dam stand and would it hold the water behind it? Well, two considerations. What type of structure are you going to build to dam up that stream? And what's underneath the pond that you're going to form? If it's porous, if it's very permeable, then you're going to build up water there and it's just going to go right out the bottom. So he had to have a survey made. And they went down with their probes, their drills, and they found that at a certain level, there was a thick layer of clay, very impermeable. Good, build your dam, the water builds up and it won't move fast through that clay and you can have your pond.
Okay. Um, now this is an average value of groundwater movement, right? It, it varies widely, but on average, uh, water will move vertically about 14 meters per year through the existing structures. That could be as little as like a 10th of a meter up to 100 meter, meters per year movement, right? So this is an average value. All right. So when we talk about groundwater, that's just what it is. It's water in the ground. And it moves under the influence of gravity. Water, some of the water on the Earth's surface percolates through the soil layers and through the, the uh, basement rock. Um, and as it's moving, this is the unsaturated zone. In other words, there is air entrained in there also, water and air. This is the zone of aeration. When it reaches a level where um, it can't move anymore, then it stops. And this is the zone of saturation. And the boundary between those two layers, the moving where water moves and where it stops is called the water table. You can actually find uh, air in the pores through this zone of aeration. That's why they call it the zone of aeration. Whereas in the zone of saturation, the pores are completely filled with water. Okay, so in this zone of saturation, we can view that as a reservoir for groundwater. and can be tapped by drilling a well. You wanna drill the well below the water table, but you don't wanna go out the other side, right? You wanna go down far enough so that you can pick up the water and uh, acquire as much of it as you need without running the well dry. Now around lakes and streams and springs, the water table uh, occurs at the surface. I've got a picture for you here in just a second. But the water table can uh, seasonally vary. It can go dry and the water table can drop, right? During the rainy season, the water table can rise, so it can move. Uh, I thought I was gonna have a picture for you. But when you have a, when you have a river flowing, let's say uh, we've got this, the river's flowing right this direction. So it's like this, like that. The water table is going to be right here at the level of the water. And if the level of the river drops, then the water table may be here for a while, but it'll eventually drop down and the water will move into the river channel, the stream channel. Okay, this groundwater is stored in bodies of rock, sand, gravel, whatever the case may be. And this storage area we call an aquifer. The best aquifers are made with sedimentary, porous sedimentary rock, sand, and gravel. Most aquifers, to access them, you must drill a well into them and pump water out from below the water table. Here's an example. So there's the well that reaches down into the aquifer. The water table is here, and the water is flowing down toward the stream, right? So water movement occurs on the surface in the stream, but it also moves through 
the uh, saturated layers of the ground. And typically, it's confined by an impermeable layer underneath. Okay. Sometimes the um, aquifer is confined. In other words, it's got a permeable layer underneath, it's got a permeable layer over top. So as the water gradually moves through the aquifer between these impermeable layers, um, if you drill down, Say we've got um, the soil surface here, and you've got an impermeable layer here, and another one here, and here's your aquifer. Right. So um, the charge zone is up here, but if you're if you're down here and you drill a well below the layer of the water table up here, then you can get the water out of that well under its own pressure. You don't have to pump it. That's an artesian well. And it has to have a confined aquifer to do that. All right, here's an example. So here's the recharge zone. And here's the aquifer at some lower level. Notice that the level there is below the level, the highest level of the water table in the uh, aquifer. Sometimes, um, rather than calling a well, you can get springs, right? So if there's a if there's a break down here in this uh, upper impermeable layer then the pressure here can force water out that spring and it'll flow across the surface. Okay, I mentioned that groundwater is a limited supply, a limited resource. Uh, water tables vary. And they also change with how much is being drawn out of them for municipal or farming purposes. Uh, if you know how fast the aquifer is being recharged, then you can limit your extraction to how much water comes into it is how much water you can take out. That's if you want to uh, maintain that aquifer at a, at a productive level. The recharge is the rate that water replacement, that water is replaced into the aquifer. So the discharge would be how much you draw out, the recharge is how much goes in. Those two have to balance. Otherwise, the aquifer is gradually going to decrease its level. Its water table is going to drop. This is a map uh, of the central United States. You'll notice the, the states not, um, identified here. There's Nebraska. Kansas, Colorado on the west a little bit, New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma. There's some South Dakota and Wyoming in there too. This is a subsurface structure, a massive aquifer called the Ogallala. And it's, it is huge. It's very large. The recharge zone for the Ogallala aquifer is up here in South Dakota and Nebraska in place place called the sand hills and the the aquifer itself emerges at the surface and it's made primarily of sand right so it holds a lot of water or it did originally and uh, rainfall in these regions replenish they recharge the aquifer unfortunately the extraction rate of water for municipal and farming purposes is higher than the recharge rate. 
and the level, the water table of the aquifer has been measured as decreasing by several feet a year. Most of the water in the aquifer came from the melting glaciers. Right? They sent their water as the glaciers melted, went through into this structure and filled the, the aquifer up. There are over 150,000 wells at last count in this aquifer alone, extracting water primarily for agricultural use. This is basically the breadbasket of the United States, this region, the high plains, very productive soils. One other thing that we notice, along with the drop in water table, uh, if you pull water out, what do you leave behind? You leave voids, spaces. And if those spaces are large, then the overlying overburden is heavy enough that it compacts and fills those spaces with soil particles or with rock particles or whatever the case may be. What you see on the surface of the earth is subsidence. The level of the earth around the wells that are drawing this water out will decrease in elevation. It, it can be devastating for buildings, for pipelines, for roads. You can destroy structures by this subsidence. You can even, if it occurs in low-lying areas, you can even enhance flooding, particularly along the coast. Here are three pictures of subsidence in the um, uh, Central Valley of California. Lots of irrigation there. They've drawn out water for decades. Here's a, <laughs> here's a, um, um, a fire hydrant used to be at ground level, right? Now it's several feet down to the level of the, of the ground. Um, this power pole is marked with where the ground level used to be in 1955. And at 1977, when this picture was taken, the level has dropped about, let's say this sky is six feet tall, one, two, three, 18, maybe 25 feet subsidence. Similar thing over here along this roadside. You can see the subsidence that has occurred. Okay, how is groundwater contaminated? Well, it could be contaminated by uh, agricultural activities, right? Um, excess fertilizer can soak into the ground and, um, and cause problems. Or industrial activity can take pollutants and they can be, uh, they can percolate into the ground, groundwater. Sometimes they can even be injected into the groundwater, but um, EPA has put an end to that. Other ways, notice that the groundwater in the in coastal areas is separated based upon, is uh, layered based upon density. Fresh water is less dense than salt water. So it will be higher up. If the salt water is intruding, it will intrude underneath the fresh water. Right? So um, if you are, if you have a well into this freshwater source on the coast and you pull fresh water out, then that's going to make a void for the salt water to move in. And eventually, you can start pulling salt water out of your well, and at that point, you can't use it anymore. This is what it would look like uh, near the ocean. There's the water table. Um, here's fresh water. There's salt water. 
um, and they there's a zone of separation between the two. If you start pumping water, fresh water out, you may eventually start pulling salt water into your well. So what are some of the consequences of groundwater over usage? Water tables are lowered, we mentioned that. The ground may subside and coastal areas, you may get saltwater intrusion. <clears throat> so we have to manage our groundwater wisely. Um, we mentioned the uh, introduction of pollutants into the uh, groundwater by percolation from the surface. Some of these examples I mentioned before, even household chemicals can uh, leach into the groundwater. Fertilizers, excess fertilizer, over usage of fertilizer can be a problem. Um, you can get that into the groundwater or it can run off into streams and undergo a process See if I can spell this right. Eutrophication, especially if there's excess phosphate in the water. Um, it tends to uh, promote the growth of algae. And you can, you can quickly overwhelm uh, streams and settled bodies of water, like lakes and, and uh, larger bodies. And what eutrophication does is the, the bloom of algae is so fast that it, um, it creates an en environment that's uh, inhospitable to other living organisms. <laughs> you can get fish kills, in other words. Pesticides can accumulate, especially those that uh, are persistent. In other words, they don't break down readily in the environment. Or they break down, they transition to other chemicals that are even more lethal than they are. That can be a problem. Sewage, right? Sewage can leach into the groundwater. Herbicides, overuse of herbicides. Detergents even. Uh, petroleum products. A host of others can, can contribute to groundwater contamination. All right. So how do we treat water before we're gonna use it? To produce potable water, that's the official term. It's, it's drinkable, it's usable for, for anything without um, uh, cause of disease or injury. Well, a municipal water supplies usually treat water with chlorine, which kills bacteria and viruses. And that's fine, you know, but that's all it does. It doesn't remove chemical pollutants. It takes more effort to get those pollutants out. Um, on a limited scale, you can filter the water through, particularly through uh, activated carbon and uh, zeolite, which is a, special kind of mineral, uh, and that will uh, remove some, many of the pollutants and some of the resistant organisms that the chlorine doesn't kill. They do exist. Uh, and other chemical process may, processes may be required to remove these pollutants. Okay, this is not a pollutant. Uh, but it's characteristic of water in some regions of the country. Hard water, which is usually the, the caused by uh, an excess of dissolved calcium and magnesium salts. Um, southeastern West Virginia has hard water. Lots of calcium, lots of magnesium. So what does that do? Well, sometimes it's just a nuisance. If you try to uh, wash your clothes 
in hard water, it takes more detergent than normal or a special kind of detergent. Uh, and scum very often forms as a result. I, I don't have time to go into the reason, the chemical reasons for that now, but just take it at face value. Um, sometimes iron will also do this, iron in uh, hard water. I mentioned earlier that I lived in Louisiana for 13 years. Uh, down there, the well water that was supplied for the city of Baton Rouge was uh, drawn from wells, right? And the recharge of those wells was, was pretty good, right? Because we were right next to the Mississippi River, and that's a, a huge amount of uh, fresh water that could serve to recharge our aquifer. But we didn't want to draw water from the Mississippi River because it was so dirty <laughs> and polluted. Uh, it was more cost effective to draw it from wells and let the soil <coughs> and the aquifer clean it up for us. Um, you can get scale in your pipes, which can clog the pipes over time. Uh, I mentioned um, uh, reduced detergent action, action uh, yellowing, bathtub rings, less ability to lather. That's hard water. How about coastal regions? Um, now we're going to talk about, uh, we're still going to talk about weathering and erosion uh, in coastal areas that are interfaced with the ocean. All right, so what type of activity? Where is energy concentrated? That's the key. When you talk about erosion, you have to think about energy. Surface waves contribute a large portion of the energy along the shoreline that uh, contributes to erosion. Um, and they can, it can take landforms of uh, varying amounts. They can be rocky cliffs right up to the edge of the ocean, uh, or you can have low sandy beaches. These are the five major oceans of the world. Pacific is the biggest, and the Atlantic is pretty good size. Indian Ocean is reasonably. Arctic, uh, largely covered in ice. And then the Antarctic Ocean, which is a little more tenuous in its um, boundaries because it surrounds a continent and it intersects all the other, well, not all the other oceans, it intersects the Pacific, the Atlantic, the Indian Ocean, not the Arctic. Um, the average depth of these oceans is four kilometers, about two and a half miles. Now there are deeper sections and there are shallower sections, but on average, the oceans are, are two and a half miles deep, about four kilometers. The deepest point uh, in the ocean is in the Pacific, the Western Pacific, and it's 11 kilometers down, which is about, uh, about six and a half, seven miles down. So there are basically three types of movement of, of uh, seawater, ocean water. You got waves, you've got currents, and you've got tides that move water from one place to the other, and in the process can contribute to both erosion and deposition. Okay. Most ocean waves are formed by the interaction of winds across the surface. Right? That's not the only way to form waves but most waves are formed that way. And they can vary in size, right? The bigger the body of water, the, the longer wind is in contact with the water. So the waves can become larger. 
uh, across a, a small lake, you'll rarely get waves more than a few inches high. But on big lakes like uh, Lake Michigan, Lake Erie, Lake Huron, Lake Superior, Ontario, the Great Lakes, um, you can get waves that are several feet high. And they're going to move and intersect the coast at some point. The shoreline will be impacted by these waves. The interesting thing about the wave is the wave moves, but the particles, the water upon which the wave is based, move very little. They move more or less in a circular fashion as the wave moves through. So the wave moves and the water doesn't. So typically, uh, if you have uh, flotsam, uh, debris on the water, it just tends to bob up and down. Um, as the waves enter shallow water along the coastline, this, uh, this underwater circular motion that's contributing to the, the wave action uh, elongates. And as you get closer to the, the ocean, I mean the, the shoreline, the circular motion is impeded near its base by the water, but it's still moving on the backside. So it tends to build up and you can produce surf. The waves tend to rise in size. Now, in some places, those, those waves can be 30, 40, 50, 60 feet high, like on the north shore of Oahu uh, in Hawaii, is renowned for the, the waves that strike that shore. And surfers, uh, accomplished surfers, will go out and try to ride those waves. So this is an artist's depiction of, of the wave. Here you get the circular motion of the particles. But when you get close to shore, the circular motion is impeded here near the, the surface of the, uh, the. The land underneath the water is impeded, and that allows the top of it to break over. You can get currents also. Now there can be mid-ocean currents, right? They're definitely like the Gulf Stream is one notable one. But now we're talking about currents that are close to the, the shoreline where you can get erosive effects. You can get long shore currents. These typically result from um, waves. Instead of the wave, Instead of the wave moving in like this and direct, directly impacting the shore perpendicular, most of the time, the shore is like this and the wave is moving like this. And when it strikes the shore, it slows it down here and that produces a notable, a noticeable current, long shore current. Um, that can be dangerous for swimmers because that longshore current can pick you up and move you not, not just along the shore, but can take you out to sea. So you have to be careful. That can produce other effects that we don't have time to talk about right now. The third movement of ocean water is due to tides. The periodic rise and fall of the ocean um, that largely goes unnoticed out in the open ocean, but along the shoreline, you can see the relative change in height of the water. And um, it varies um, primarily based upon the gravitational pull of the moon. 
and to a, a lesser extent, the sun. They, they tug on the water. Uh, whereas land won't move much, water will under gravitational uh, influence of the moon. So, um, the size of the tide varies. And there was a, a discussion in chapter 17 about this. So we're not gonna uh, focus on the formation of the tide itself. Just, just to say that if you want to refresh your memory, go back to chapter 17 and uh, look at tides. Um, the variation of the level of the tide is not just dependent upon the moon and the sun, but upon the, uh, the terrain. In other words, what's underneath the water when the tide forms. That can influence the height of the tide. And it can be as little as a meter or as much as 12, 15 meters high, very high. Right. Um, so all of these factors contribute to uh, erosion along the coastline. Now, um, these zones where the ocean meets land are often referred to as intertidal zones because the water moves in and the water moves out. And you have a very uh, diverse and active ecosystem developed there, plants and animals both, in that region. And their behaviors will be based upon water movement in and out um, under the influence of the tides. Uh, this is going to show you uh, tidal movement over a period of probably 12 hours. So between high tide and low tide is about six hours, a little bit more than six hours. So between one high tide and the next high tide should be 12 hours. Right? So we're not going to sit here for 12 hours and watch a, um, a slow moving video. This is a time lapse. So that gives you a perspective between high tide and the next high tide, this video will cover about 12 hours. And this is in the Bay of Fundy in uh, Nova Scotia, uh, Canada. So there it's peaking and now it's going down. You can tell it's time lapse because things are moving kind of jerky. Low tide, water's gone. Now the tide's coming back in, fills back up. And that took about 12 hours. Now we're gonna let it go back down again. And let's see, that video should be over in a second. They're gonna let the water come in again. So we went through two cycles, almost two cycles, because that boat's still laying on the ground. All right. Here's another phenomenon that's due to the tides. It's called a tidal bore. So as the tide uh, moves up a river or into a bay, um, it can move at a pretty rapid pace and form a, a wall of water as the tide moves in. This occurred in, uh, in a place called Moncton, New, New Brunswick, Canada. And actually, you're going to see a uh, surfer riding this bore as if it were uh, an ocean wave.
It'll take a couple of minutes. It's worth watching. Look on the left-hand side, and you'll see this surfer coming up here. There he is. I think he's close to shore for two reasons. One is you get the bounce of water off the shore and makes the, the wave higher. And um, closer to shore in case something goes wrong, <laughs> the rescue is closer. It's about over. Okay. So what does coastal erosion look like? Coastal erosion forms a number of different features <clears throat> and contributes to irregularities in the coastline. If the coastline is already irregular, that can contribute to a certain type of um, erosion. Uh, if you have a part of the shoreline that juts out into the ocean, then it's going to be more exposed and can be eroded more rapidly. So if the coastline is, is elevated, like you have a cliff coming right out to the ocean, the erosion is only going to occur at the lower levels, as high as the tide gets and as high as the waves can reach. Right? So you can develop erosion down here with an overhang sometimes. You can get uh, wave cuts into the cliff face. You can get things called sea stacks, where the, um, the waves have cut around and left like a pillar sticking out of the water. You can get sea arches where the water erodes underneath and um, it creates an arch. And you can also get erosion that works its way into the cliff face and makes caves. Those caves would not probably be a good place for a permanent residence because they were formed from water action. And the water can make them and it can come back and fill them up again. So this is an illustration of some of those things that can happen. Sea stacks, there's an arch, there's a cave, and you can get undercutting, wave cut cliff. When that happens, um, eventually you exceed the ability of the cliff to uh, hold the overburden up and they fall into the ocean. So you can actually, over time, cut the cliff back by undercutting it. There you get some examples of, uh, there's an arch, there's uh, the beginnings of a sea stack. And you get some sloughing away of material. You can see these large boulders down here. Those came from the cliff face as it fell apart. And then the waves continued to work on them. Okay, that's eroded deposition along the shoreline. And here we remember um, erosion and deposition are based upon energy. High energy will cause erosion, uh, lower energy can lead to deposition. Okay, so you can get shoreline erosion or you can get streams 
entering the ocean near the shore and their sediment load can then be redistributed by these longshore uh, currents and wave action. Okay, so what are some features? A uh, pocket beach, like a pocket beach is just that. Right? You got your shoreline coming along. And somehow or other, you have this pocket built into the beach. Maybe it was eroded that way first. And then uh, as uh, currents move in like this and around, they slow down over here and you build up a beach. That's a pocket beach. You can get barrier islands. So as the currents flow past, longshore currents flow past, their velocity is higher out here and it slows as you get closer to the shore. So you can get a uh, deposition along here and as you build up deposits here, what you can do is actually produce a funnel effect, a funnel effect between these deposits and the shoreline where you can increase the velocity and keep this section eroded out. And now you have um, barrier islands. Barrier islands are extremely important to maintain the coastal integrity through storm events. The barrier of islands will absorb a lot of the energy from storms like uh, tropical storms and hurricanes and preserve um, more delicate features behind the, the barrier islands. You can get lagoons forming, right? They're just kind of, um, if you, you form an island out here, then in here is a lagoon. So the deposit occurs right there in the entrance. And you can get spits, okay? So if rapidly moving current passes an irregularity, then as it moves past that area, it slows down here and it deposits. And you elongate uh, the original landform, that's a spit. Okay, so here's a pocket beach. There's a lagoon that's now uh, encased or mm, partially encased by barrier islands. And then these spits form when the, if the current is from, from right to left, then they deposit, they erode and deposit uh, beyond the irregularity in the landform. Okay. Um, these are just in words what I've described so far. Uh, Barry Islands are very common along the uh, uh, southeastern United States coast and along Texas. North Carolina has a lot of them. Georgia has a few. Uh, St. Simon's Island is, is a barrier island along the coast of Georgia. Um, um, North Carolina's most famous is uh, Outer Banks is a barrier island. Actually, it's a collection of barrier islands. Lagoons can form uh, as a consequence of barrier islands and spits elongate extensions of the shoreline. The most famous of that is Cape Cod, Massachusetts. It's a huge spit. How about seafloor topography, right? We've talked about um, what the continental surface uh, processes and features are. What about underneath the ocean floor? Well, used to be, scientists believe that the ocean was pretty much flat and covered in sediment. It was uninteresting. That's no longer the case. We know now 
that the ocean floors are as complicated, complex in their topography as the continentals topography. Right? You get mountain chains, submarine mountain chains. You can get isolated volcanic mountains. You get trenches. And there are extensive flat areas, that's true. Where do these mountain chains occur? Predominantly mid-ocean ridges, where the plates are moving apart and new ocean is being formed. That's where you find the sub submarine mountain ranges. The volcanic mountains are usually positioned over hot spots, like the Hawaiian Islands, for instance. Um, you can get submarine seamounts, that is, those have not broken through the surface or, or have broken through the surface, but it's kind of like the top's been chopped off. That's due to erosion. And these flat top uh, seamounts are called guyots. They used to be volcanic islands, not anymore. The seafloor trenches, these usually occur at plate boundaries uh, where subduction occurs. So one plate dives under another plate, and these are both plates that are in the ocean, right? It's not uh, an oceanic plate diving under a continental plate. This is an oceanic plate diving under another oceanic plate. And they form these trenches. They're very long, very narrow, and uh, occur at these subduction zones. Um, I mentioned earlier the amount of sediment that's carried into the Gulf of Mexico from the Mississippi River. Well, you combine all the rivers of the world doing that same thing, you send lots of sediment uh, into the oceans. And this continental erosion is the primary source for sediments that, that settle onto the seafloor. And then the, sea, the actions of ocean currents, and waves, and other activities uh, redistribute that uh, sediment. One of the reasons that we thought the, the seafloors were just uninteresting was that these sediments can be very, very deep. They've been accumulating for thousands and thousands of years. So they can cover up features that are buried underneath. They mask these uh, irregularities. The flat areas that do exist are called abyssal plains. Abyssal because they're very deep. And plains because they're relatively flat. And that's where most of the sediment uh, settles in the deepest areas. Now, there's an interesting feature that occurs at the edges of all continents called the continental shelf. The continental shelf is made up of continental crust. In other words, it's the same material that makes up the continents, only it's submerged. Okay, now at the edge of that, you, you, have, um, you have the continent coming down here to the ocean. And there's the, uh, let's see, say the ocean's not here. Then it continues to go down some more. This is the shelf. But eventually, you get the continental slope. This is continental material. Right, the same geology as the continents. This is oceanic plate material. All right, these are gonna be very shallow 
compared to the main, the ocean, right? Several hundred feet at the most. And they're reasonably narrow. I mean, um, they're never more than 1,200 kilometers or about uh, 850 miles wide. And that would be really wide. Most of them are narrower than that. Now, um, this area right here, at some point in the Earth's geologic history, uh, was exposed, was dry, particularly during times of planetary glaciation, right? Lock all the water up in glaciers and that the sea level drops and these areas would be dry and plants and animals would uh, fill up those areas. And then when the glaciers melt, the ocean rises again and uh, covers them up again. Continental shelves are economically important. Right? They're, they're very productive fishing zones, uh, particularly the continental shelves off the New England coast. Well, actually, continental shelves anywhere around <laughs> the uh, United States are going to be productive. They just produce different things. Right? Along New England, you, you get a certain species of fish up there. Along the uh, mid-Atlantic and, and South Atlantic coast, you get different things. Along the Gulf Coast, you get different fisheries there. But the, the continental shelves are very productive fishing zones. Anywhere in the world they occur, they are productive. Not only that, on the continental shelf, uh, we have discovered large deposits of oil. And that may be as a consequence of this well, no, I can't say that. I was going to say during these dry periods, but oil takes much longer than that to develop. So uh, scratch that idea. We don't know when they developed. At least I don't know when they developed. But these offshore oil deposits are there and they're being exploited. Okay, so here's, here's the shelf. There's the continental slope and the uh, okay, I misspoke somewhat. Continental crust is also part of the continental slope, and the oceanic crust occurs further down. So the continental slope is uh, continental crust, and the oceanic crust is further out with a collection of large amounts of sediment, and these constitute much of the abyssal plains. Okay. Um, right, so I mentioned plate tectonics earlier. Um, these, these plates that move are um, less dense continent, continental plates and more dense oceanic plates. And that's why you get them, the continents riding up over the uh, uh, oceanic crust. Okay, so this one last video drains the oceans and shows you in a sweeping panorama uh, features of the world's oceans, and then we'll be done.
But the credits run out. And we're done. That's chapter 23, surface processes on the earth. One more chapter and we'll be done with this, with uh, physical science 102. Chapter 24 coming up.